Watch our videos and review your learning with the Crash Course app. Supplemental content is now available for these courses. I am joined today, I don't know if you know this about me, but I am not uh, an expert in world history or indeed in anything other than signing your name over and over again. So I am joined by an actual expert who knows a lot about world history, Kathy Keller. Hello, Kathy. Hi, everyone. I'm Kathy Keller. I'm a history teacher and I was a consultant on the Crash Course European History series. And we are so grateful to you for doing it. Thanks. Thank you. So here's how the study session is going to go. We are going to uh, ask questions that you have sent in. Many of you have sent in questions ahead of time. Um, so we're going to get to those most pressing questions. Uh, we'll go through some of those. And then uh, we will provide a few tips on studying world history and maybe even a little bit of uh, test taking advice. And we will end with answering some questions from the chat. So questions, uh, if you're watching at youtube.com slash crash course right now, questions that you can ask us and we will be answering those as well. So before we get to the first questions, we wanna start a little bit by talking about our partner for office hours, Flipgrid. Flipgrid is the free video discussion app from Microsoft with a mission to make learning fun and empowering and accessible for all. It's been used in the classroom for nearly a decade. My kids use it. I was going to say your kids probably use it, but if you're studying for a world history test, you may not have kids, but lots of kids use it. As we talk about preparing for exams, Flipgrid is a convenient way to host study groups without having to coordinate around class schedules or after school commitments. You can create a group, start a topic, and send the link to anyone who wants to join. You can record video or audio responses, discuss specific concepts in detail, quiz each other, prep for group presentations. It's really flexible. We hear from Crash Course viewers all the time about how helpful video is as a learning tool. And it is one of the reasons, of course, why, why we make a Crash Course. But connecting with peers and learning in groups with your peers in community is a wonderful and really powerful thing that Flipgrid helps make happen. We use Flipgrid to collect some of your questions for these live streams. Okay, so we're going to get to that now. All right. So All right. Kathy, before yes. we answer any of these questions, can I ask you a broad question? Sure. Because when I'm studying for a test, I personally find it helpful to have a sense of why I'm studying for the test, why the mm -hmm. test exists, why I'm studying this at all. So why do you study history? Why do you teach history? Why do you think it's important to learn history? I mean, I, so I was an English and history double major in college, and I think that those two go so well together in part just because I love stories. Like one of the things that first, the, the, probably the two things that first really hooked me on history were the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and um, the Russian Revolution. I don't know why those two things, but I just found the stories and the people so interesting, and I think we can learn so much about the present by studying the past. Now, I don't really think that we learn from the past to avoid making the same mistakes. I think we're actually pretty bad at that, but I feel like understanding how people have done things in the past can make us make better decisions now if we're paying attention. Um, unfortunately, I think that a lot of people just assume history is a bunch of memorizing names and dates. And I think that it's much more about like big connections about how people work, about how societies work, about how we make decisions, what works, what doesn't work. Um, and I just think it's informed so much about how I think about the present that I find it just endlessly fascinating. And also people are weird. They do, they do really bizarre things. Um, yeah. And, and that never fails to entertain me. <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way. Like there's something wonderful about knowing that a lot of our problems aren't new and about yeah. knowing that a lot of the challenges we face aren't new. And also there's mm -hmm. something wonderful for me in knowing that a lot of the challenges that we used to face that seemed completely unsolvable and unaddressable in their time got solved mm -hmm. uh, and got addressed. And and for me, like that's a real that's a real encouragement. There's some hope for me in history. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is the story of people making the same mistakes over and over again. <laughs> but it is also a story of um 
of real lasting change. Like life today is different mm -hmm. from what it was like during the Russian Revolution. And it is certainly different than what it was like uh, in the 1200s. And mm -hmm. the story of how we went on the journey that we've gone on in these last 800 years or 10,000 years, however long you want to define history is really, really interesting. So mm -hmm. I agree above all else for me, it is a fascinating story that helps me understand how we got to now and why now looks the way it does, which also makes me think about how now might look different. Mm -hmm. With a little right. hindsight. Yeah. Yeah. It like gives you a little bit of an ability to see your historical moment um, in a greater context, which for me anyway, makes my historical moment slightly less terrifying, only okay. slightly, <laughs> but it does help. Um, yeah, so we're going to actually start with the Russian Revolution. We're going to start Great. with your favorite or, the, or what got you hooked on history, the causes and effects of the Russian Revolution. Uh, so get Grover, and I apologize if I mispronounce any of your names, or indeed if I mispronounce the names of major historical figures, I'll remind you that mispronouncing things is my thing. He asked, they asked, what, uh, can we talk about the background events that triggered the Russian Revolution? And Deneo asked why Rasputin was so important to the royal family. And I want to add a PS there, Kathy. Was Rasputin so important to the royal family? I mean, I think that he was in the sense that they had this desperately ill child who they were hoping to cure, and there was no cure for hemophilia at the time. I think it's been overplayed in part because he's such a fascinating character. And so, I mean, the pictures of him are just so- funny. Oh, he's a great, um, nobody, nobody looks like no. Rasputin. <laughs> no, I mean, they're, they just, they seem over the top really. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, he was over the top. His personality was huge. You know, I mean, I think he was kind of a party animal. Um, but so that was just helping part of though a larger destabilization of Russia at the time, right? And so just to kind of give some context for Russia in 1917, for a lot of the 19th century, Russia was pretty reactionary and slow to modernize. They weren't really industrializing very quickly. There were some exceptions like Alexander II, who was um, the czar, freed the serfs in 1861 and banned corporal punishment in the army, but he was assassinated in 1881. And when Nicholas became czar in 1894, he was never very popular. Um, he supported some of the attempts by his advisors to re reform and modernize, but he really only agreed to the creation of the Duma or the parliament because of a revolution in 1905. Right. So, once World War I starts, or once the Archduke is assassinated, Nicholas supported Serbia after his assassination. And then Russia's involvement in World War I was, I think, really the death blow to the Russian monarchy. Um, Nicholas didn't really create any kind of administrative machine to support the war effort with things that were important in war, like guns and bullets and uniforms and <laughs> medicine and right. food. Um, so they're just consistently trounced by the Germans on the Eastern Front, which was absolutely brutal. Um, this is going to cause all sorts of war, weariness, war weariness um, mutinies, and, and general strikes that make it even harder to continue fighting and producing the goods that they needed to fight the war. Um, Rasputin is just going to help to delegitimize the Tsar. Um, I think, you know, one of the reasons that Rasputin looked to have so much power is probably just he didn't touch uh, Alexis, and that probably helped prevent the forming of clots that might have been forming. There's some other theories about why that could have been, but hemophilia was untreatable. And, you know, here's this kind of creepy guy in tight with the royal family that was just further de delegitimizing him. Um, but to look at 1917 specifically, there's actually two revolutions in Russia, Russia in 1917. So the first starts in February which is on the old Russian calendar. So sometimes the dates are a little funky when we get to the Russian Revolution. In Petrograd, which we now call St. Petersburg, which they had previously called St. Petersburg, but we'll say Petrograd for now. Um, so on Inter International Women's Day, uh, women had this parade and started protesting food scarcity and casualties and all these kinds of things. And the protests spread 
or the parade, I guess, becomes a protest, it spreads, and then soldiers rebel, they joined, and Nicholas is forced to abdicate. So that's kind of the beginning of the first revolution. In the meantime, the Duma, or that parliament, declared itself a provisional government. And they had all sorts of political parties in there represented. Um, Alexander Kerensky kind of leads to the front of that. He was a moderate socialist that came to lead the provisional government and tried to revive the Russian war effort. And meanwhile, the Petrograd Soviet, which was a workers' council of workers in Petrograd, was also claiming to be the government and issuing its own decrees. So that was destabilizing. And then in April, the Germans put Lenin, who was a radical Bolshevik intent on overthrowing the whole system on a train, gave him money and sent him to Petrograd. So Lenin starts making all these speeches about peace, land and bread. And that all sounded pretty good to people who were war weary, landless and hungry. So that's Yeah, I bet that sounded good. But so a couple just to stop you and, and, and uh -huh. reinforce a couple things. So we, we generally refer to this uh, revolution as the February Revolution, even though mm -hmm. the 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 dates are a little weird um right. and so but 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 we think of it we we generally talk about it as the february revolution right mm -hmm. yeah. and that lenin uh vladimir lenin ha had been in exile in germany um in, and then he's in switzerland yeah but the German exile in, in switzerland mm -hmm. and then the germans basically funded his uh journey to russia correct me if i'm wrong here in an attempt to further the destabilization of mm -hmm. the Russian government to weaken its ability to fight World War One mm -hmm. against Germany. Right. Okay. Which was a pretty brilliant move, right? And the yeah. British did it to the Ottoman Empire too with uh, Lawrence of Arabia. So they weren't the only ones doing it, but I, I always thought that was pretty smart. Um, so when Lenin gets there, he's giving all these speeches and rallying all the support, but we've got these two governments kind of rallying for uh, control. And Lenin just stages a coup in October of 1917, basically taking over the government buildings. And then they hold an election, the Bolsheviks lose. So they just dismiss the assembly. Um, in 1918, they signed the Treaty of brest with Germany, which gives up most of their Western holdings and gets Russia out of the war. And then basically immediately become entrenched in a civil war with the whites, who was basically everyone who wasn't a Bolshevik. Um, that goes on for a while until about 1922 when the Bolsheviks just declare victory, rename the country, the Soviet Union. And then we start talking about Soviet history and not Russian history, because we've got to change that name too. And that is that revolution is the October revolution, right? right. So that's right. in October. Um, there's the second revolution where Lenin leads this coup. The, they hold an election. They don't like the results of the election because it was too uh, fair, I guess you might right. say. And yeah, they, uh, I mean, they didn't win, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So they lost the election, which was a real bummer to them. So they dismissed the Duma um, and then end the war with Germany, which of course makes sense because that's how part of how Lenin got uh, got to Russia in the first place and was, was in the mm -hmm. position that he was in um, and then focus on uh, the civil war against the whites and, and how to form a new uh, communist uh, country or, or at least a, this, this particular Bolshevik version of communism mm -hmm. country. Um, and then by 1922, that country exists uh, and we now know it as the Soviet Union. And mm -hmm. that is the same Soviet Union that existed until 1991, right? Yep, exactly. So that was a big moment in history. Um, one that some would argue continues to reverberate. <laughs> right now. Yes, very much right now. Um, the history of the Soviet Union and the relationship between the uh, SSRs of the USSR, the Soviet Socialist mm -hmm. Republics of the USSR is, of course, right now at the center of conversations about um, Ukraine and, and uh, at the center of Putin's argument that uh, Ukraine is not a legitimate nation. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just one example of how history from 100 years ago that feels very distant um, continues to shape the world we live in. Yeah. 
Next, we have a couple questions about my favorite of the uh, major uh, world history empires, the Mongol Empire, the truly exceptional Mongol Empire, different in so many important ways from uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the empires that uh, have traditionally been the focus of um, history classes in the US. So who was Genghis Khan? And why was he able to get so much territory in so little time? Which, to be fair, is a, it, it is a tough question to answer and one that is, is still debated. Right. And I think that we'll find that with a lot of these questions. It's not like historians can always put their answer in a nice little box. They're continuing to debate these things. New information comes out. Um, yeah. History is kind of constantly evolving. So um, Chinggis Khan, who before he was known as Chinggis Khan was known as uh, Temujin, came from a pastoral group or a herding group of these feuding Mongol clans and tribes during the 12th century. And he supposedly had a pretty magnetic personality, which helps him to build up a following of friends. And he forges all of these alliances with more powerful leaders. Um, he wins a series of victories, and he was known for being pretty ruthless to his enemies, but pretty generous to his friends. He also would um, incorporate a lot of the warriors from the defeated tribes into his own forces. And so then he's renamed, I guess, uh, or becomes known as Chinggis Khan, which was the supreme leader of what was now unified is the great Mongol nation. Um, the army was pretty well organized and disciplined which allowed the Mongols to eventually take over most of Asia or much of Asia and Eastern Europe, kind of capitalizing on some weaknesses there, the um, Abbasid Caliphate and divided China, which eventually results in the largest land-based empire in all of human history. So even though they don't have a huge lasting cultural impact on the areas they conquered in terms of bringing like a new language or religion to the area, it facilitated all of this Afro-Eurasian trade and communication. And then it, their, their collapse, I guess, will leave this big power vacuum that will be filled by the Ming Dynasty in China, the Ottoman and the Safavid empires in the Middle East, and then the Russian state in Eastern Europe. And um, I just thought it was interesting too that apparently climate change might've actually benefited them. There was a particularly mm. kind of wet, warm period in Central Asia that led to this boom in grass growth and thereby livestock and horsepower, which is part of what they relied on. So Wow, that is really interesting. Um, a yeah. reminder that like human history is also the story of other um, species, whether that species be, um, you know, the, the uh, infectious agents that cause bubonic plague or uh, something like uh, warm, wet weather that allows grass mm -hmm. to grow to feed lots of horses and have a little more horsepower. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting though, that, that, you know, th this, this gets to something really important in history. That's, that's, you know, one of the great questions, does, does history make the man or does man make history is the way that it was phrased when I was a kid. Hopefully it's phrased mm -hmm. in a slightly more inclusive way these days. <laughs> what is the relationship between individuals and systems? And when we talk about Chinggis Khan, we have to focus on these systems that were that were falling apart at the time mm -hmm. that he rose to power uh, in, in China, that the dynasty was falling apart, that the Abbasid Empire, which had been a really powerful, um, the, the caliphate there, which had been a really, really powerful and, and super culturally and historically important uh, empire, um, you know, spreading, uh, uh, spreading Islam and, and, uh, and, and, really shifting a lot of things that those were both so weak that mm -hmm. this left a power vacuum it left an opportunity uh for the for the mongol empire to come and i think it's also really important to i really like how you focused in that answer um on it while acknowledging that it's it's not like a you know all of these areas after after the the relatively brief mongol empire we're, we're speaking a different language or or we're in, engaging in different religious practices necessarily but by connecting those places, it did lead to a lasting shift in Afro-Eurasian trade, mm -hmm. which had a huge impact on the history of the world. Yeah, totally. And you see like a upswing in the Silk Road trade, for instance, during that period, which right. is really important. Yeah, like at the center of how, you know, all of Afro-Eurasian history went, really. Mm -hmm. um, 
so yeah, I think that it's, um, you know, we often, uh, there's a, uh, there's a, one of my favorite books. I want to make sure I get the title right of one of my favorite books of history is called the, uh, the calamitous 14th century. Oh yeah. The, uh, Barbara Tuchman. Right? Yeah. 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 That Barbara yeah. Tuchman book. And, um, it, you know, if it hadn't been for the growth of this Afro-Eurasian trade, the growth of the Silk Road, um, mm -hmm. you know, these these much deeper connections among uh, that, that ranged all the way from from Japan to to Portugal and and to Central and Southern Africa, if it hadn't been for all of those connections, we might not have had the Black Death, or certainly might not mm -hmm. have had the Black Death in the same way we ended up having it. Um, we also wouldn't have had a huge explosion, ex huge explosion in the distribution of knowledge in that period. So mm -hmm. what a what a fascinating. Uh, so in that sense, like uh, the you know, the, the what Chinggis Khan left behind was super important to the rest of human mm -hmm. history. OK, there were a bunch of questions about the Cold War as well. I feel like Sasha maybe put it best uh, asking, how did the Cold War start? I feel like the beginning is so muddy, like the end of World War II, everybody's happy about winning. And then, boom, mortal enemies measuring each other in the amount of weapons <laughs> able to exterminate the human species. <laughs> it does. It does feel like a little bit of a dramatic escalation. I agree. Also, Vivi wants to know uh, how to understand uh, I don't know. Is it com con and common form? I've only ever seen these words written. Yeah, I think it's comic con and common form. And now that you say that, I'm not 100% sure either because I mostly see them written. So I hope you're right. <laughs> yeah, but to be fair on your test, you'll probably see them written as well. True. Um, so talk to us about the Cold War. So, I mean, this is, com I feel like it's always complicated, right? It's always complicated, but yeah. there's, you know, there's all this debate amongst historians on the causes of the Cold War, and it shifted so much over time based on kind of current political uh, climate. So was it an ideological mm -hmm. struggle, or was it one based on geopolitical power after World War II? And in the 1950s in the West, a lot of historians post or, you know, kind of pointed to that deep ideological divide and Stalin and the Soviet Union's aggressive expansion after World War II in Europe and Asia. And this was called like an orthodox interpretation and just basically uh, showed America is making, uh, reacting to Soviet aggression. Then revisionists would point to American economic expansion in Europe and even going back to like the open door policy of protecting American markets that went back to like the 1890s. But starting in the 1970s, the post revisionist historians, so this all gets a little ridiculous, I think with the names, but uh, people like John Lewis Gaddis had the benefit of hindsight and detente was going on and some new archival material, though I wanna point out not the Soviet archives yet. And the post-revisionists argued for more of a middle ground, kind of pointing to the allies delay in opening a second front in World War II, which left the Soviets fighting basically alone in Europe, uh, Truman's atomic diplomacy, Washington's refusal to recognize the Soviet sphere of influence in Eastern Europe, and they look at more kind of complex social, political, and economic causes of the Cold War. And when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, the Soviet archives open up, which leaves historians with all this new information. Gaddis, for instance, is going to take a much more negative view of Stalin. Others start focusing again on these ideological struggles. Um, and people like myself who went through school in the Cold War, and I, I think you too, basically learned that communists were evil and trying to destroy the world. And I think it's important to think about our own subjectivity when thinking about the Cold War, like how much is that impacting how I view different primary sources. Right. Um, so if we look at kind of more modern interpretations and we look at like the Marshall Plan is offering all this American aid to help rebuild Europe after World War II, to strengthen it against Soviet influence and attempting to contain the spread of communism. So containment's a big idea there. Um, Stalin balked at Eastern European countries accepting the Marshall Plan because he saw that as American expansionism. And so he created Comic-Con to prevent Eastern European countries from aligning themselves with the West, so providing that aid himself. Um, common form, to answer kind of the second half of that question, was the international communist organization led by the Soviet Union 
to organize communist parties across Europe. But as Chinese communism became stronger and made that less relevant, it was just kind of dissolved as part of the de-Stalinization that happened after Stalin's death. Yeah. Yeah. So just to go through a couple things, um, a couple important points there, I think. Um, so maybe at the very beginning, you know, we, we were taught that it was, I mean, I was certainly taught that it was an ideological struggle, a purely ideological struggle between on the one hand, an ideology that focused on individualism and individual freedoms. And on the other hand, an ideology that focused on um, the, the overall average com communal good, even to the point of terrific, uh, astonishing oppression, terrific mm -hmm. being, I don't mean like in the good way, uh, right. astonishing oppression of individual expression. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of like the way I learned it in high school. I don't know if that's the way you learned it, but that's kind of the way that I was taught about it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, and, and obviously, right, the oppression is a huge deal. And economically, they weren't able to produce the kind of consumer goods that were in demand. Um, right. There were all sorts of, of flaws in the Soviet system. I think, though, that looking at the Soviet Union as this kind of monolith gets problematic, as any yep. kind of monolith does with people, right? Because we never agree on anything. Right, yeah. And and over time, there were different Soviet unions, like the Stalin Sto Soviet Union, even early Stalin, Stalin Soviet Union was very different from late Stalin Soviet Union. You know, 1938 was vastly different from 1951. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's definitely part of it. But the the understanding the relationship i don't know how important it is to the test you might you probably will but understanding the relationship between those initial ways of thinking about the cold war um that these were just like an ideological disagreement about what the human social order should be with both sides but at least from our perspective when i was a kid especially the communists trying to impose their worldview in the so-called third world the third world being the first world being the us and its allies the second world being the soviets and its allies and the third world being like the world that we were all fighting over to decide what the future of humanity would be um that th th this was sort of a purely ideological struggle. And then along come the revisionists and say, well, actually, I think it's a, it's a lot more uh, complicated than that. And, and that maybe we shouldn't only be looking at the way communism is trying to expand its influence, but also look at the way the U.S. is trying to expand its influence in the West right. is. And then the post-revisionists argue for, just to restate it, I'm asking you. Oh, just, I guess, kind of a middle ground, like yeah. trying to, which is, you know, they asked for simplification of how did it start? And I was like, well, here's the <laughs> it's I, pretty hard. Yeah, it's, it's right. not simple. Right. I don't think you need to na name these schools of thought necessarily on the AP exam, but understanding that there's different perspectives on this, I think is important. And I would say that the post revisionists were just kind of complicating, looking at more social, political, economic causes and not just that ideological divide. Right. OK, let's move on to uh, a question from Tim Ruckel, who asks, how was uh, Kwame and Kruma and Ghana significant in the non-aligned movement, African decolonization, and more broadly in the Cold War itself. Um, yeah, so he's, kind of, I think that whole movement's kind of interesting, speaking of kind of a middle ground. Um, the non-aligned movement was this sort of third option during the Cold War. It started with Yugoslavia and its leader Tito, trying to establish independence from Soviet-led communism. And it did have some impacts on UN decision-making during the Cold War. Um, Kwame Nkrumah was a part of the non-aligned movement and thought that capitalism had done a lot of damage to Africa, envisioning socialism as kind of the best way forward because it had egalitarian goals. And he was the leader of the independence movement in Ghana against British colonization and was elected as the first president of Ghana in 1960. Um, and he was a pan-Africanist, which I think was an interesting idea, meaning basically he saw Africans as sharing a common history and a common destiny whose solidarity and sort of collective self-reliance would empower people of African descent on a global scale. So that's even gonna have an impact on the American civil rights movement. So for instance, Malcolm X travels to Ghana 
um, and and you know they're all kind of talking together. So it's interesting again to see that communication right on a on mm -hmm. a global scale. Yeah, yeah. So this is another example of how we uh, we may want to uh, put uh, histories into continents or into particular communities, but in fact, all history is is world history on some level. Mm -hmm. And I think I tended to learn more kind of a country at a time. Yeah. Um, and I think world history has been interesting looking at these big global movements, right? Like looking at huge trends and how they affect all these different um, different areas of the globe, but are interconnected, right? We can never detach ourselves from that interconnectedness. Yeah, of course, decolonization was not only an issue for colonized nations, but also for imperialistic ones mm -hmm. uh, and for ones that claim not to be imperialistic, but still had, um, uh, you know, sort of state sanctioned underclasses. And so that that's, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense that um, Malcolm X would be going to Ghana and, and, and learning about decolonization there and, and trying to bring mm -hmm. some of those ideas back to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Here's a question from Gabrielle. What are the differences between the Aztecs, the Incas, and other Native American ethnic groups? That's that's broad. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why we talk so much about the Aztec, the Incas, and the Maya. You know, I feel like those are the big three always in uh, the Americas. But, you know, obviously there's other groups in the Americas uh, by 1200. Um, but those are the big three that I think get brought up a lot, in part because they're really big. Um, we could sort of debate other reasons why, but I think it's interesting to think about those areas geographically because when you think about the Incan Empire, for instance, it stretches largely kind of north-south along the coast of, you know, mostly what's now Peru, um, rather than kind of east-west, which is like most of Europe is kind of in that east-west you know, similar latitude. So they span a much bigger range of climates, not mm. to mention, you know, the elevation going up and down. So I just think that's kind of an interesting thing about yeah. them and, and how much that must have impacted um, development. But uh, the Aztec and the Inca had both forcibly taken over and absorbed other cultures. So the Aztecs were kind of the last and the largest of these Mesoamerican states that emerged before Spanish conquest and then grew out of the Mexica alliance with these two other states. And its power came from conquest, which made it a little bit unstable because the areas that they conquered would rebel. Um, and then the areas that they conquered owed payments in the form of labor and materials to uh, Tenochtitlan. And the city itself was an absolute wonder to Europeans. I mean, they were just in awe of its size, of the chinampas, or these like floating islands where they, um, where they grew food that were used for farming. Um, people talk a lot about human sacrifice in, in, with the Aztecs. It, it did play a role in Aztec public life, um, but they weren't alone in that, so I wouldn't overemphasize it. Um, and the Aztec emperor, Montezuma was eventually conquered by uh, Hernan Cortes, the Spaniard. Now the Incan empire was much larger than the Aztec state geographically and might've had as many as 10 million subjects. These are sort of estimates, but they were more bureaucratic than the Aztecs probably because of that. Um, they used, I think it's pronounced uh, quipus, a series of these kind of knotted cores, cords to record um, demographic data and do all of this accounting. Um, and they required the people that they conquered to learn uh, Quechua and to do military service to the empire. So state authority kind of permeated much further into Inca society than in the mm. Aztecs. So that might be something I'd say if I were asked to compare and contrast them. Mm -hmm. um, in Incan society, women had matrilineal descent and worshiped the moon and men worshiped the sun and traced their descent through their fathers. Um, Atahualpa was the last emperor after, uh, the last Incan emperor after a civil war caused by the death of his father due to smallpox, speaking of like global mm. things impacting yep. history. Um, and he was defeated by Pizarro. Yeah. And we should say that smallpox was not, uh, in the Americas before the Columbian right. exchange began right. in 1492. 
Right. And just was so devastating. You know, some estimates are as yeah. much as 90 percent of the population of the Americas. Yeah, this is a particular uh, this is like a pet issue of mine, Kathy. But I think uh -huh. that disease is overwhelmingly the most important historical force. <laughs> like it's huge, uh, right? It, it, it completely reshaped. I mean, it, it became it was, you know, uh, I think the historian Frank Snowden describes it as largely incidental, although there were uh, uh, episodes of, of what amount to bioterrorism. And yeah, it had a huge impact, obviously. I mean, 90% of people in the Americas died. Um, and, you know, uh, 500 years earlier, or 400 years earlier, uh, probably half of people in Eurasia died in a, in a four or five year period uh, during the Black Death. These are these are huge, huge historical forces that we tend to ignore because war and kings are so much uh, more interesting. <laughs> well, and I think COVID gives us a much better appreciation of that, right? Like, yeah, when I think about the 1920s in the U.S. and like jazz clubs and all of that, now I'm like, of course they went and partied after the influenza pandemic. Like they were yeah. tired of quarantine, right? Right. Um, I feel like it just changed my whole perspective on that. Yeah, me too, for sure. Um, all right, Stan, are we going to talk about nation building? Oh, great. Uh, we're going to talk about nation building, America's favorite topic. <laughs> Molly <laughs> wants to know how nation states emerged. And uh, relatedly, Adahan wants to know who Mustafa Kemal Ataturk was. Yeah, so I think this is an, a fascinating question because you see this in world history, this sway between kind of local control and stronger national control, like that's an ongoing topic. And I suppose empires are the other extreme of local control with countries controlling these large groups of other countries. And in the 19th century, nationalism led to a specific form of countries kind of driven by this sense of common identity because of language, religion, ethnicity, similarity in cultures. Um, and in Italy and Germany, nations were brought together by these strategic, eventually by these strategic limited wars. In multi-ethnic empires though, like the Ottoman Empire or the Austrian Empire, a lot of nation states were created in the aftermath of World War I because of what Woodrow Wilson called self-determination or groups kind of roughly deciding their own boundaries. Um, before you had war to build a nation though, there were often these idealistic groups who helped to propel that sense of common identity or kind of defining who they were. So. Uh, Young Italy, for instance, uh, created by Mazzini, gave Italians this kind of rosy dream drawing on the glory of ancient Rome. And the Young Turks in the Ottoman Empire forced um, Abdul Hamid II to restore a constitution in 1908. And they're pretty, uh, the Ottoman Empire was pretty ethnically diverse. They had Arabs, Albanians, Jews, etc. And much more, that group was much more about kind of liberal political reform, but they eventually would splinter off into groups. And um, one of those groups became more nationalistic, creating kind of a single party state that would lead the Ottoman Empire into World War I. And then like so many other empires, World War I is just devastating to the Ottoman Empire. So when World War I ends, um, nationalists led by Mustafa Kemal Ataturk took the Turkish empire part of the Ottoman empire and they, they abandoned the Sultanate and the Caliphate. So they're no longer like the head of, of Islam in the world and transformed Turkey into an independent, modern, uh, secular Republic, you know, kind of thinking as, um, it, it was a way to make Turkey, I don't know, bring it into the new age. Um, they did have sort of an enlightened authoritarian rule under Ataturk. Um, he considered gender equality a mark of modernization. So women got the right to vote and hold public office in 1934. Uh, polygamy was abolished. Women were given equal rights in divorce, but his program of unification through Turkification, that's kind of a mouthful, um, emphasized people speaking Turkish changing their surnames um, if they were ethnic minorities to names that sounded more Turkish. So you, you really get that still like very nationalist bent. With and that idea of building a nation in part through Turkifying it, through having one, one ethnic identity that stretches from across the entire country, no matter mm -hmm. what somebody's, uh, you know, 
uh, past might look like or, or what their own ethnic identity might, might be to themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's such an interesting idea, right? Of like, how do you define who's us versus mm -hmm. who's them? And that's, yeah. I just think, a fascinating thing to look at throughout history. Yes, there's so much of, um, yes. And, and this is something we talked a lot about in the in the European history thing is that, um, mm -hmm. in the European history crash course is that the negative integration strategy for mm -hmm. forming an idea of a, of a people that, that a people have a shared identity is to say, we are not this, uh, right. we are not this, we hate these people, these others, um, are, are the opposite of what we are, and we will identify ourselves by being not this and by trying to oppress mm -hmm. or marginalize or even destroy them. Um, mm -hmm. And then positive integration strategies focus on, um, on, on ways of creating uses without them, which is maybe right. harder, at least according to what we've seen from history, but there are some examples of it. Yeah, I mean, like a national anthem, you need a mm -hmm. flag, mm -hmm. um, holiday, uh, all of those things help. Build yeah, national right? heroes that you put on your money right. um, your statues. that can come from a maybe come from a variety <laughs> of, of ethnic groups or a variety of linguistic backgrounds, but 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 mm -hmm. still uh, share the national identity. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got a question submitted on our, our Flipgrid group. It comes from Nia from Bulgaria, who asks, what do you think is a better way to look at history? On one hand, there's the emotionally detached way of looking at it, where you just look at the facts and the figures, and you're very objective and sort of look at it as almost a fiction, like it happened to a different species or didn't happen at all. You just detach yourself from it. Or mm -hmm. on the other hand, you can look at it as fully grasping that every single one of these people was an actual person who actually lived and died just like you will. I feel like that's probably the right thing to do because history is most importantly a human story, but it's mm -hmm. also very emotionally difficult. So I'm wondering which you think is the better option. Yeah, so um, I kind of had to face this moment in my career when I was looking at different grad school programs. Um, I was in a PhD program. One of the schools that I looked at um, had the top Holocaust historian in the country, Christopher Browning. And I had a long conversation with him about this because I wasn't sure that I could study the Holocaust for the rest of my life because it's so emotionally intense. So I was asking like, how, how do you do this? How do you do this every day? Um, and he said, you know, a, a little bit is compartmentalizing. And I think that I have learned to do that, you know, as I teach the Holocaust every year, you know, maybe three times in a day or something. Um, it's a lot, it's intense. And sometimes, um, you have to distance yourself a little bit, but sometimes you just have to let yourself feel it too, because that was my fear was that I would become numb to it, that I would not understand the gravity of it anymore. And there's moments where it just hits you like a ton of bricks. Like I remember, you know, visiting Auschwitz and seeing this, they have this room full of, of hair and it's just like 6 million Jews killed in the Holocaust. Like that's a number we can't comprehend really. Um, but there's moments like that where it just really, really hits you. So I think you let you, yourself feel it in those moments, but not let it paralyze you, I guess, and try to, um, kind of move, move forward. And, and I, you know, I don't know if we can ever be truly objective. So I'm, I'm not sure that's my goal, but to move forward, um, with what I'm researching or what I'm, what I'm talking about without letting it completely overwhelm me. Yeah, I think that's really beautifully put. And the only thing that I'd add is that facts and figures in, in history have to serve human goals. Um, we're not trying to inform artificial intelligences about what we were like. We're trying to inform right. each other. And so, um, you know, when we're studying data or, or we're studying, you know, um, uh, we have to remember that those are that, that we're talking about people and we're talking mm -hmm. about people to people. Right. All right. We're going to transition to some study tips. Kathy, give us some study tips. I need I need study tips. I I don't know about you or your students or the people watching this, but uh, the pandemic has not been great for my no. ability to focus. No, I I discovered TikTok during the pandemic for that. Me too. Because oh, it's gr I it's great. Yeah. Sorry, what I, was I'm sorry, I forgot what you were saying because I was on TikTok. I'm just oh, checking sorry. to see how a video is doing. <laughs> 
I'm sure it's uh, yeah. doing better than mine. <laughs> oh, oh, you're on TikTok? Oh, this is very exciting. <laughs> Um, I mean, so I think I, I heard actually that you guys have made a series on study skills and I've, I've looked at some of those and I think they're great, um, for the yeah. AP exam in particular, people who are, who are studying for that. I think the most, as someone who's graded those exams a lot, know your rubrics, like know how you score the points that you need on the DBQ, on the LEQ know what scores on an SAQ. And, you know, on that note, practice by doing what you'll have to do on the exam. Um, so take some practice exams, um, write a DBQ in timed conditions and, um, you know, I think if you're overwhelmed by evidence, by names, which can be a lot in history um, or events, look at the College Board key concepts and, and know the evidence for each of those concepts. Like kind of think about how, if that concept were turned into a question, how would you provide evidence for an essay question related to that um, and help help them use you to help them <laughs> use uh, what you know and, and separate that into what's important from you know this just flood of info because in the end you're going to go in with what's in your brain so you know think about how you can use that evidence in a um, in an essay so watch crash course study skills which I also recommend um, and know your rubrics and take a couple practices. You will feel so much more prepared anyway, like putting aside everything else. It just makes, uh, when, when I would do it anyway, when I was a student, it would just make me feel going in like, well, you know, my, uh, my practice SAT score might not have been very good, but I did do it. <laughs> right. You did what you can do. And like, in yeah. the end, that doesn't define you either, you know, like, yeah. I, I, yeah. I bombed one of my IB exams and I went on to major in that subject. Um, so, yeah. you know, life goes on. You'll be okay. Yeah. I think like it, it's a hard, it, that's such a hard thing to manage because you want to tell people like study hard. Like it, it can be really hard to focus, especially right now. I am so, I, I cannot imagine how difficult it is to be going to school or teaching school right now in this historical moment. I, it, it, I, I am deeply sympathetic to that situation. And, and so you want to encourage people to like study hard, do their best, work really hard, all that stuff. But it is also worth saying that like, this is not the defining feature of your life. Right. Um, how you do on an AP test is not how you are going to, is not the life you are going to have. It is, right. it is one data point out of literally millions in your life. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I got, I did, by the way, I did not do particularly well on the AP world history test. I think I got a three and I'm here, you know, <laughs> so I just heard you fail. made this series too. That was yeah. pretty popular. So I feel like it worked out okay for you. Just fail up, fail up. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to take some questions from uh, the chat now. Stan, do we have any questions? Oh, did you already put them in there? Oh, wow. This is I mean, very, very professional. Um, I should say a quick thank you to Stan and Zueha who are running this uh, this behind the scenes and doing an extraordinary job. Uh, and again, a big thank you to Kathy for joining us today. What uh, what a lovely gift. Thank you all. This is from the internet. Thanks, it, do it doesn't say which person. Why didn't the Silk Road stretch all the way across Europe? Did traders just have no interest in going further? I don't know the answer to this question. I mean, I think, I think there's a limit, I guess, to how far you can go. I mean, let me talk about the Silk Road a little bit, just in general terms. So it stretches for like 2000 years, connects China to Europe, starting around like 200 BCE. And, um, you know, the caravan Sarai where merchants and travelers would rest turned into these major Central Asian commercial cities like Bukhara and, um, over the millennia, it impacted trade, but it also spreads, you know, religions like Buddhism, which spreads widely from India through Central and Asia, uh, Central and East Asia, changing local religions um, and a lot of uh, luxury goods obviously are traded that way, mostly just luxury goods because transport was so expensive. Um, there were periods of activity that kind of spiked and waned. So, you know, we talked about the 
the last big period was the Mongol Empire kind of revitalizing it. I'm thinking that part of why it didn't spread completely, and this is not like my biggest area of expertise, so this is kind of an educated guess here, but you know, in 1453, the Turks conquered Constantinople, right, which is going to cut off European land access to the Silk Road, and it's part of why Europeans improve their naval trade to go in the other direction. And I'm thinking about what kind of, you know, before that, I think that a lot of it probably had to do with what countries had the wealth to Yeah, participate. had the markets for luxury goods, yeah. Yeah, and then also like once you hit um, Constantinople, it was easier to put stuff on a ship and then mm -hmm. move it via the Mediterranean trade than to continue right. to travel on the Silk Road. Um, so I'm, that would probably be the biggest piece was that, you know, yeah. traveling by land is hard. Ships can carry a lot more than it can. Yeah. And, and in a lot of cases faster too. Right. Um, so I think, I think all that probably went into it, but it's also important to acknowledge that uh, we don't know everything. <laughs> <laughs> Brady, uh, Brady asks, I'm curious what John or Kathy's favorite books are for history of any time period. That's a big, that's a big question. It's a tough one. Do you have one that comes to mind quickly? Well, I just read this book, The Dawn of Everything, um, that's about prehistory and makes an argument that hunter-gatherer and foraging communities were much more multitudinous than we tend to imagine, and that had that they had lots of different ways of organizing their social orders, sometimes with radical egalitarianism and often often not, and that our ideas that like, you know, before 12,000 BCE, all human life was pretty similar and pretty historically boring are, are probably, uh, probably wrong. So I, th I thought that was a really interesting book. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I really like, uh, I read a lot of gender history. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, Bonnie Smith, who worked on the European history series, I had read her in college and like to be able to work with her was so great. Um, she has a book about, it's like the history of 20th century France um, as kind of told through the like micro history of the concierge at um, where, where she lived when she was doing her research. And that was just kind of fascinating because it's like this, you know, how all these global things impact this, this one, you know, just average woman. Um, there's another book I really like called The Woman Beneath the Skin, which is about this mm. 18th century German doctor um, in the mm. German states and, and it's like women's testimonies to him about what was going on with their bodies. So you get into all this information mm. about like medical history and mm. how they perceive themselves, but it's all, mm -hmm. you know, kind of translated through him. So it, there's a lot of good thinking about, you know, how much can you trust what he said about them and how much of this is there, you know, are, are accurate accounts of what they said. And, um, it's it's hard sometimes to get to get those records of women. And so this was just an interesting avenue. Oh, that sounds it. like it is absolutely up my alley. If you can, yeah. well, what is what is the title again? Um, the Woman Beneath the Skin. It's by Barbara Duden. She has a couple, actually. I hope I'm not mixing up Great. the titles. Um, that sounds really good. I Yeah, I mean, most of what I read is about the history of infectious disease and the, and the history of medicine. Probably my favorite book about the history of infectious disease, which Stan gave me. Um, it's just, this was such a, it was such a great gift. Like it made me feel really known. Uh, Stan <laughs> gave me um, this book called The Black Death by, uh, is it Rosemary Horrocks? Is that her name? Yeah. And she collected and translated first person accounts of the Black Death. Now it's, it's a little more limited than I want it to be because it's very Europe centric. And so many of the important accounts of the Black Death occurred um, in uh, what is you know now known as, as as the Middle East or in North Africa or or mm -hmm. in Central Asia, but I mean to read these first person you know accounts you know contemporaneous accounts of what this experience was like to live in a time where half or sixty or seventy percent of people in your community were dying in a matter of a few months. And to have no idea how to make sense of it right. and to see all of these societal uh, rules break down, uh, to see over and over again, you know, people abandoning their families, uh, you know, uh, 
the 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 kind of horror of of the the death rituals breaking down because it wasn't mm-hmm. possible to ring the bells for everybody who died because too many mm-hmm. people were dying that that stuff is it's just it's it's really powerful to read and it's mm-hmm. I, I love reading I mean I, I love reading well translated first person accounts because I'm never going to be somebody who's able to read <laughs> Aramaic or uh, right. you know read middle, middle English and so if it's really well translated you just you feel the full humanness of that person and and you feel the you feel the fear um and hope you know the ineradicable hope that i find so encouraging in those mm-hmm. accounts even though they're obviously it's the worst one of the worst things that's ever happened to humans and yet like one of my favorite ones is uh this irish monk john clinn who um wrote an account of the plague and and the account ended here i leave extra parchment in case anyone is left alive to continue the story. Hmm. And then he died. And then did um, anyone continue the story? The only, the only uh, note after that reads here, it seems the author died hmm. in That's different sad. handwriting. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but I find it, I mean, obviously in a kind of dark a, a rather dark way, but I find it hopeful that we would leave extra parchment, you know, like we would hold on right. to that hope that that the story will continue um, and that somebody will keep telling telling the stories. And our opportunity and responsibility is, as people is to listen to those stories and to hear them and, and to try to make sense of, of the past through them. Uh, and Kathy, I'm so grateful to you for helping me do that uh, through Crash Course European History. Uh, but also through all your work. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to everybody uh, who wrote in questions. And again, thank you so much to Flipgrid uh, for sponsoring this live stream and giving students a really wonderful set of tools to work with. We're really grateful to all of you. And again, to Stan and Zuleya as well. It's just been uh, really wonderful to be able to spend this hour with you. Good luck on your tests. (laughs) Yeah, good luck, everybody. They're coming up in a couple of weeks here. And thank you guys for having me. This is really fun. And um, I always love to sit around and talk about history. So this has been a fun experience. Yeah, let's do it again sometime soon. Uh, This is the last of the Office Hours live streams for now. But let us know what you liked about the series. Also, don't be afraid to let us know what you didn't like, uh, because we would like to do more of them and potentially do them more regularly. We'll be uploading these live streams uh, on the Crash Course channel soon. So if you uh, missed it live, or if you only caught like the last half, you can watch the entire video soon. So stay tuned for that. Again, uh, thank you so much. Thanks for being here, Kathy. Thank you. And Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a joy to learn with y'all tonight. Thanks again. Bye, everybody. DFTBA.